And once you get into a, a car with somebody, uh, you're at their mercy. Anything could happen. Uh, being a female, you could be raped, robbed if you're a male, um, all the way to where you could be uh, killed. Uh, once you get in that other person's car, you're at their mercy. Welcome to another episode of California True Crime. I'm Sean, and tonight we will be talking about the murder of Kara Knott. Um, the clip that you heard at the beginning is a clip from San Diego's NBC7 from their YouTube page. We'll come back to the clip later and talk about it. With me is Jessica and Charles. How are you tonight? Uh, I'm doing great. Me too. Good. So for tonight's episode, I think we're going the most south of the state that we have so far. I mean, bonus episode, we went here, but uh, it's, it's a, south, a southern, southern one. We will be in San Diego County, and I'm going to get into a little detail with the events before we learn a little more about the area. On the evening of December 27th, 1986, Kara Knott, a San Diego State University student who was studying to become a teacher, was leaving her boyfriend's house in Escondido around 9 p.m. and driving to her parents' house in El Cajon, which we've talked about before in the Thanksgiving episode. This drive from her boyfriend's house to her parents was about a 45-minute drive, and if you were looking at a map, Escondido is north of El Cajon, and El Cajon is east of San Diego. She called her parents before leaving her boyfriend's house, and after a couple of hours, her father, Samuel Knott, called three different police stations in the area, but they started combing the area on their own without the police's help. Her parents called her boyfriend, Wayne Bautista, who was in bed with the flu. He was sick, so he went right to bed after she left. He had the phone by his bed that night, so he wouldn't have to get up when Kara called once she made it to her parents' house. When Kara's mom called instead of her at around 10.45 p.m., he thought maybe she ran out of gas because she was running low anyway. He got in his car and started driving up and down the freeway looking for her, Nothing, thinking nothing bad actually happened, just that she might have run out of gas. He would stop a couple of times and call her parents to see if she had shown up yet, but she hadn't. It wasn't until the morning at around 6.30 a.m., which was a foggy and dark morning, Kara's brother-in-law found her car just sitting off the interstate, which was a white Volkswagen bug, with the keys still in the ignition and the driver's side window down. This is when the police came to help look for Kara. About two hours later, her body was found by police near Los Penasquitos Creek Arch Bridge. After the autopsy, it was determined that Kara had been strangled and thrown off the bridge, which stood about 75 feet to the ground. Charles, could you give a little background on this area and maybe a little more history on Interstate 15, since this seems to be the crime scene? Yeah, uh, Interstate Route 15 is a major major north-south state highway that connects San Bernardino, Riverside, and San Diego counties. So this is one of a, a bigger arteries for Southern California. Uh, The California portion is also called SR-15 for state route. Uh, It's the southernmost part of I-15 and consists of around 289.24 miles uh, of I-15. The rest of I-15 that extends beyond our state uh, goes between Southern California into Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Montana, and then ends at the Canadian border. Uh, Within California, it's one of the largest avenues travel between San Diego and the Inland Empire, as also as well as between Southern California and Las Vegas. Uh, There are portions of this route designated as the Escondido Freeway, 
the Avocado Highway, Temecula Valley Freeway, Corona Freeway, Ontario Freeway, Barstow Freeway. Um, There's also a portion called the CHP Officer Larry L. Wetterling and San Bernardino County Sheriff's Lieutenant Alfred E. Stewart Memorial Highway. Um, You also might sometimes call it the uh, Mojave Freeway. Uh, It began and was planned to actually go through an entirely different route and cut off most of Southern California. And it would actually have been about 100 miles shorter. But California argued that because of the amount of population in Southern California and they wanted to reroute the the interstate so that it would actually connect all of the military bases in Southern California. So uh, places like March Air Force Base, NAS, uh, Miramar. And this was successful. And the new path was drawn up encompassing a lot of smaller highways that are eventually going to kind of merge into this interstate. Thanks, Charles. So, Sean, one of the things I read was that because her family was out looking for her, and I go, I know you go into the different uh, things that are just heartbreaking about this case, but her father was out looking for her and saw police pull over to the side of that bridge and thought they looked like they were looking for something. And so he's actually there when they find her body, when they're up on top of the bridge, which is just really heartbreaking. It's horrible. Yeah, the, the whole story with... We, we'll learn more about the father, and it's, this whole story is just heartbreaking, especially with him, too. After a couple of days, the police have some leads but no suspects and also put many on the case to try to solve it. Uh, Kara was last seen stopping for gas at a Chevron off of the 15 by the North County Fair Mall. Her body and car were found about 15 miles south of this. Kara's body was found on Sunday, and on Wednesday, which was New Year's Eve of 1986, a memorial was held for Kara where over 250 friends and family came to show their respects. At the memorial, people talked about how Kara was a track star at Valhalla High School and an honor student at San Diego State. She was laid to rest next to her grandfather at the Singing Hills Memorial Park in El Cajon. One thing I found is that the family was very unhappy how the original phone call to the police was handled. Kara's father talked about how when he called to say that Kara was missing, he was told by the dispatch, dispatcher that, quote, if I had a nickel for every time someone called like this, I could retire. They also told the father to call the jails. Um, I can understand they might get a lot of calls, maybe about, you know, missing people here and there that show up, but I don't think this is any way to diffuse the situation when someone is scared. Another thing the father said is that the night that they were searching for Kara, they stopped two different CHP officers and told them what was going on. He said that the CHP would tell him multiple situations like, oh, she's 20, she can take care of herself, or she probably had a fight with her boyfriend, and they also they also didn't write down any information. Any thoughts on how this situation was handled? So um, Kara's father, Sam Knott, is someone I think we'll probably talk about a lot later, is really an interesting person and spent the rest of his life fighting for uh, reform for victims. And one of the things I learned, because I looked him up, was that prior to this crime, when you called in this area to say that somebody had been had gone missing or you couldn't find them, um, it wasn't even a priority for the police because you would get a lot of calls, that kind of thing. So they had to put them in order. So property crimes were more of a priority than victims wow. who went missing. Her father works very hard to get this changed um, and to kind of flip those two things so that when people call, you know, they react and do something. Right. The other thing I learned was that at this time that this crime happened, CHP, by law, wasn't responsible for any crimes that came in like that for the area. They would be responsible for crimes directly on the highway. So when you would call 911 and say, my daughter hasn't come home, she's missing, they wouldn't call CHP. Um, And that's something he works hard to reform as well. They changed the law so that if your route as a CHP officer falls within a certain town or a certain area and a crime happens, you are also responsible for responding There was originally, in the first couple of days, a $10,000 reward that was put out with any information that would lead to the arrest of the killer. 
close to two weeks after finding Kara's body, an anonymous donor, this is what it says in the paper, the anonymous donor doubled that, making it 20000 and they started putting flyers with Kara's picture in hopes to find any new information. Uh, in an article I found about a week later, uh, the re- reward money was actually all put up by the family. They just said it was anonymous, but they're the ones that raised it up to 20000 There was also theories being thrown around with this time of uncertainty. Kara's father thought that someone had jumped into her car at the gas station and had her drive to the remote location that we'll talk about soon. Other thought she might have picked up a hitchhiker that killed her. There was also a theory that someone forced her off the road while she was driving. On January 15th, 1987, an arrest was made for the killing of Kara Knott. The man in custody was Craig Allen Pyre, a 36-year-old CHP officer from Poway, California. He had been on the force for 13 years. Uh, Pyre's route was from Poway Road to Balboa Avenue, and that's roughly 16 miles on uh, the I-15. And his hours of work were 2.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. So Poway is north of San Diego, but south of Escondido. Before I get into any more details, I have to, I've been getting a lot of info for this case from the Times Advocate, which is a paper out of Escondido, California. The front page of the paper on January 16th, the day after they arrested him, there were four articles. One being about the resignation of Chinese Communist Party Chief Hu Yaobang, and the other three were about this case. The main headline was, CHP officer arrested in killing. Then the other stories on the front page for this were, tips from public lead to Poway man, suspect described as real nice guy, and psych tests only used on officers since 1985. Then if you go to page two, there are two more stories called CHP officers tell public not to lose trust and woman recalls creepy CHP stop made by suspect. This was a big deal in the area. What do you guys think about why it was so big and some of these headlines? Well, I think that the headlines, I think, echo a lot of the things that we've talked about in previous episodes. And I know stuff that we've talked about when we're not recording is this knee-jerk reaction to maybe describe sometimes a suspect in either overly glowing terms or demonizing them for, uh, you know, newspapers or, or, or television. I also think one of the reasons why it, other than just the tragic death of Kara Knott at the hands of a police officer, so this was only a couple of years bef- before this happened, before the murder of Kara Knott, the CHP had another officer that was uh, arrested for uh, the rape and murder of a young girl in Southern California on the I-15. So I wonder if part of that is still fresh in people's mind and the CHP is is using that as a way of, or, or using the media as a way of saying, we're, we're, this isn't a rash, We sh- please don't lose trust in us. Right, and the media using it as that they might see that wounds are still open and in the minds of people, since it was only two years before, making it a big story. And it's it's so similar. You're not talking about two different parts of the California. We're talking about within the same area now not necessarily next door but right you know within the county it's it is also another veteran of the force it's another young girl you know the the modes of death are obviously different but so let me break down what i got from these articles before the arrest the people the police kept saying they're not even close to solving this case and in this article they said tips started coming in just a few days before they made the arrest This was uh, January 16th, but one thing in the tip article that I found interesting is that they say they interviewed many people, and they even interviewed Pyre a while back, then put him on administrative leave without pay on January 5th. So I'm assuming the detectives maybe had some thoughts already. The whole article that talks about him being a nice guy was the usual neighbors being shocked and saying their normal stuff. Uh, The thing that bothered me in this article is they started going into detail about his character like he's the victim. They talked about how he liked to go off-road riding and would load up dirt bikes for a little getaway in the desert. 
this was my take, so I asked you guys to look at the article and uh, see if you felt the same way or looked at it any differently. I didn't really think they were trying to make him a victim. That wasn't my take, but I know it's different when you're reading all the articles together. Right. You hear things and see things that the rest of us don't. So I wouldn't say that you're wrong or anything like that. What is bothersome is we've seen this so many times, just trying people surprise, people humanizing him. Um, And I know in this case, he's an officer. And at this time in the 80s, I think uh, respect for that um, was pretty high. I think when I was reading stuff about another case, when I had to do the media and stuff, people's idea of those being... If you were always telling the truth, and I know that's how it is in a courtroom too. If a if a police officer testifies to something, jurors often statistically accept it more. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just a lot of people trying to work it out in their minds. I don't know what the point of printing it is, but yeah. And at the same time, I mean, when I read it, I knew the end result mm-hmm. already. So maybe if I didn't know the end result reading it, I might have thought of it differently. But. But you probably have a better sense because you're reading all this stuff about him. So you're seeing it's not just that article. It's this other stuff. And you can see that there is maybe sympathy or people wanting to see that part of him. Yeah. But I do I do think it's a little different, though, when you look at at who the suspect is. You know, I I think he he, this is a upper middle class. He's not not only just an officer of the law. But I I struggle with seeing that if they would describe him in the same way, if he was another in ethnicity or if he wasn't necessarily a cop, if he was just somebody, you know, either an out of towner or some things like that. I, I, I'm not too sure. Right. They wouldn't go into detail about his life that much. No, what I what caught me, too, about that article is and I think this is going back piggybacking on what Jessica said, something also we see a lot of times is when we're researching the, these cases, sometimes it's a lot harder to find de- those kind of details about the victim, the actual victim. You know, um, thankfully, in this case, Kara's family w- was on the forefront and involved. And, and I know we'll go into that later, but they made a note. And so many of these cases where the family may not be able to or Looking at the last case that we covered with the Hernandezes, where it was a struggle to find any information about her, you know, a pregnant woman and her four-year-old child. So, I, if anything, I'd, I guess and it's not a solution to this. I just wish that they would spend as much time on the victims as they do on the actual. The yeah, murders. and I think in the in this case they did. I mean, that it was. It was headline after headline all the way since they found the body, and they were really focusing on her. But in a lot of cases, you're right. It's totally – they they don't have anything. Some cases, we don't even hear about them, just like Hernandez, until another thing happens, like Lacey Peterson. Right. There were also a couple stories that women had talked about being pulled over by Pyre in the same spot or close. Uh So this area was a little remote exit called Mercy Road. The exit leads to dead-end roads on both sides of the freeway. There was nothing. It it was just an exit to nothing. Some brush-covered area, and it was dark and isolated. On January 25th, which is a little later, uh, later, Kara's family actually got the ramp closed for a year because it did nothing. Um, It was pointless. Now it actually goes places. It's a functioning exit. Uh, all these stories made the papers after the arrest, but they were a lot of these calls came in to the police before the arrest of these these stops from Pyre in on this remote area. In one of these cases, it was a couple that got pulled over on the same spot, and the man thought it was weird that they had to go to such an isolated area. When Pyre pulled them over, he said they were speeding. The man said to him, why couldn't he just have pulled us over on the side of the highway? This man actually called the CHP the next day to complain about the stop, and they told him that there was nothing wrong with how Pyre handled the stop. There were more that said that they'd been pulled over at this stop, and they all knew the dates of when they were pulled over since they received tickets. Thinking about it in a weird way, it's like it was his comfort zone or something. That This was the only murder that happened, but he would constantly pull people over there, and 
you think that's on the right path? Like he just felt comfortable? Yeah, because his patrol area is such that this is like, I won't say like the perfect hunting ground, but that's kind of out there. But it is a quiet, remote place that's not obvious as you're driving by. You know, it is an off ramp. And when you see play, you see pictures of it, it's obvious that, oh, yeah, if something was going to do something bad, that'd be a perfect place for it. Yeah. And him having, you know, a cop car, he can easily get people to go there because the you get pulled over, you're going to listen to the police. Mm -hmm. And so this one's a hard one for me because I think I don't have I don't know how many people he pulled over at other places. So I can't even say if this is significant that he did it more here than other places. Yeah. Um the other thing is I was really interested to see what you are supposed to do, which I probably should know as a driver in California. But according to the law, you should be pulling off off the highway. When a police officer pulls up behind you and is going has his lights on, you should slow down, you should put your hazards on, and if at all possible, the best thing to do is to pull off the the freeway. Like take an actual exit. Yeah. That's okay. the safest thing that you should do. Um, barring that, you can pull off to the right. If you pull off to the left, you will definitely get a ticket. That's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, but always doing the safe thing is, you know, and you less likely to get hit if you're not directly on the freeway. So it's just hard for me to say. Yeah. I can understand these people looking back and thinking, oh, man, that happened to me, too. Right. But. And it would be interesting to see, because there's it's probably not the only spot, but if there was a. And I'm sure somebody probably looked at that, but where you have so much construction up and down California with these on ramps and off ramps that are being closed for period of times. I wonder how many times that a highway patrol officer uses that because you don't have to worry about traffic coming up or down. You know, it's going to be closed. Nobody's going to come up behind you or, or right. And, and I, I, I agree. It's, it's weird and odd. And I wonder how much of that is looking back on it, knowing how, this story ends versus at the time reading that story would you would you have thought that too but at the same time before they even arrested him you had people calling in because they thought it was weird they knew the exit that she was killed at so it's like oh I think that's, man that that's like that same place and i thought it was weird beforehand this is even weirder i think that's even more significant too is that the amount of women that are calling in and not just women but Men and women calling in saying that they had a weird experience with a highway patrol on that area. Yeah. Pyre was held without bail after his arrest. Friends and family of Pyre also set up a fund to help Pyre's family. The money is going to his family while on unpaid leave. But these people also believe that Pyre was wrongly accused and he had never lied in his life. During his arraignment, Pyre pled innocent, and the bail was set at 500000 and 1 million bond, which we've described many moons ago in a different episode. But, Charles, can you please give a brief on that again? Because I always forget. Yeah, we have talked about the bail system in California before, but just a real quick recap. When you're arrested for a crime and the judge authorizes bail, um, for example, you know, $1,000, then the the person has the right to put up 10% of that and then that that will be a lot they'll be allowed to leave until their trial now at this point you know most people don't have that kind of cash laying around so what they would do is they would go to a bail bondsman who for a fee will put up the 10% on the idea that you'll show up for court you don't show up for court then your the full bond fee is forfeit to the court and um, in this case, the bail bondsman would be on the hook for that. So that's that they charge like a handling fee. OK. One thing that was talked about right when he was arrested and during the arraignment is that the evidence packet of 49 pages should be kept away from the public view. They discuss that there are a lot of things that can't be used in court and the case is already so public and in the limelight. But the prosecu prosecution only wanted it sealed until the day of arraignment. This is when Pyre's defense attorney spoke up and asked if we can if he can keep it sealed. So the judge that day sealed it indefinitely. 
A couple of days after this, a judge, on consideration from the prosecution, raised bail to one million since many witnesses were scared that he might get out on bail. This was also, at the time in San Diego, the highest bail set for a non-death penalty case. The defense attorney kept talking about how Pyre will never be able to afford this and wanted it lowered to 300000 This was January 27th. It wasn't until over a month after Kara's death that the news came out that she was not sexually assaulted and that she was strangled with either a rope or wire. On February 12th, 1987, in the Los Angeles Times, I saw that I saw something that was pretty crazy to me. You know how Pyre was put on administrative leave with no pay? Well, at this point, he is now getting his salary again and gets back pay for the 115 days that he was suspended. It was a state law that if, if a suspended officer is not fired within 15 days, that their suspended pay goes back to normal. Pyre's family had also raised $4,000 with their funds at this point. I couldn't find any, like, the law about the back pain now. I was trying to find something just to see if this has changed, but I, I couldn't find anything. So if I understand that correctly, then if I'm a police officer, I'm arrested for a crime, I'm put on suspension without pay, then for that length of time, I, I get, all my pay goes to, uh, like, a holding tank and then at some point i get that back yeah i'm assuming as long as you're not fired within 15 days so even though i'm arrested for the crime and ready and charged with it i'm still not technically fired that's why he got that yeah okay now on march 4th pyre was actually able to come up with the 1 million bail that his attorney said he could never come up with and walked out of jail around 9:30 p.m. Friends and family actually came up with $100,000 to pay bail. So then after this, a judge decides that even though he got his full-time payback and even though he was able to raise the money to get bail, he was still able to keep his court-appointed lawyer and his legal fees will be waived, which I find pretty interesting there. So let's start getting into some of the evidence that led to the arrest of Pyre. One was a ticket that had been written to a teenager on the night of the murder by Pyre. The 17-year-old boy was driving home from his sister's house in Mira Mesa after watching the movie FX with his twin brother and her. Do you remember the movie, FX? Oh, I do. (laughs) I thought you would. (laughs) Uh, I've watched it uh, more times than I can remember, actually. Uh, And uh, we will post up some information about it on the website, actually, because I was really excited that this was mentioned. Yeah, I've never actually watched the movie. I think I've only remember being a kid seeing like the Tonight at 8 on HBO FX. Like that's all I remember is the little preview of it. If you saw the cover in the video store, it was one of those that really kind of stood out because it's very plain. It's just the letters FX, and you have um, two, the two main characters' faces on that. Like I said, I looked up some of the history of it. It actually was a, uh, it holds a eighty-eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes nice. with um, twenty-five reviews. And um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. So they watch this movie, and then so he he didn't leave her house until about nine forty-five p.m. He was pulled over about 10 p.m. on Highway 163 because of a broken taillight. He received a fix-it ticket and went on his way. Didn't think anything more about it. The next day when he looked at his ticket, he saw that the time of 10.20 p.m. was crossed out, and then it said 9.20 p.m. Again, he didn't think anything about it until the homicide detectives came and questioned him about a week later. So knowing this little tidbit, they were on to Pyre pretty early, which could be why they put him on leave, but didn't have enough evidence that they needed yet. So this actually wasn't the first time the detectives came to this young man's house. The detectives were there a couple days before to ask questions about the night. He was pulled over just saying it, it was the same night that Kara was killed. They wanted to know about Pyre's appearance that night. 
they asked the teenager if he could see any scratches on Pyre's face. Now, if you go back to the intro of the episode where we heard the clip that we played, uh, this was Craig Pyre talking. This happened the day after Kara Knott was killed. According to the LA Times, it was the day after. A local news reporter for a television station down there wanted to do a report on what to do when stranded on the side of the road. Pyre was the one that helped the news station out. The audio of for the intro of the episode was Pyre from the news segment. If you don't remember what he said, or it was not that clear, it said, quote, Now, once you get into a car with somebody, you are at their mercy. Anything can happen. Being a female, you could be raped, robbed if you're a male, all the way to where you could be killed. Once you get into the other person's car, you are at their mercy. Now, from the video, supposedly you can see scratches on his forehead and on his nose. I couldn't see anything in the video, but Pyre said that he got these falling against a fence. We'll post the video on California, or CaliforniaTrueCrime.com just so you guys can look at it too. But thoughts about this at all? It was really eerie. Yeah. Knowing, in fact, I think this was the first thing you played for us when you said that you were going to research this case. And knowing how the story ends, that clip sends chills up your spine. Right. It's just, it's so crazy. It was the day after. So there's a forensic file episode about this case, which is a plus because I like forensic files. Other shows I have my opinions about, like we've talked about in other episodes, but I think Forensic File is, is a staple in these, you know, in the true crime community. They gave a lot of information on evidence in this case. So from the autopsy report, like I said before, they had ligature marks on the neck from something such as a rope or wire. You also had a big bruise above Kara's eyebrow. The bruise was thought to have been from getting hit with a large flashlight that Pyre had. They also found rope in the trunk of his police cruiser, and that's how they, the knots from the rope matched the marks on Kara's neck. On the bridge that Kara was thrown off of, they found skid marks that were 53 inches apart. This is the same distance of the tires on the police cruiser Pyre was using. So... Now for the real scientific evidence that seemed to really at least do it for me, if I was on a jury, were about fibers and blood. First, they found a drop of blood on Kara's shoe. This is the late 80s, so DNA was really just starting, so they would just check to see the blood type. The blood type on the shoe was AB, which is one of the rarest blood types. Pyre had AB blood also. They also found two different sets of fibers to work with, one of them being purple fiber found on Pyre's boots and gun. This fiber matched fibers from sweatpants Kara was wearing that night. They found gold fiber on Kara. When they examined the uniform Pyre was wearing that night, they found a very similar fiber from one of his shoulder patches. They then dug deeper in comparison of the fiber, and it was a perfect match for each fiber. So fiber evidence is uh, something I have a bone to pick with because it's just not really scientific. It's often some of the evidence that juries consider really scientific. But um, even now, there are a lot of organizations and the FBI, lots of people who've been found guilty on this kind of evidence. And the science is just kind of junk. It doesn't back it up. In this area, there's not even a single way to look at fiber evidence. Um, on the stand, people will say it was either a match or it wasn't, when really there's not a good way of telling any of that. Uh huh. And it's just a really dangerous science. And I know it's not used as much any, anymore because of DNA and also because it's, you know, crap. But um, <laughs> it's just a really dangerous, for me, it's just a really dangerous thing to base a lot of your case on. I think it was like when we did Ronnie Chase and we talked about bullet science. Yeah. And this kind of falls, it's even worse than that, but it falls into the category of that where really it should be about there's fibers that you find and there's similar fibers perhaps on the person. Um, but what are the likelihoods that this fiber is found all over the place or on other people? How common is it? 
there are ways to narrow down statistically how likely it is, and which is what they should present. You know, 50% chance this came from Pyre. Uh, you know, 99.9% chance. Similar to what we do with DNA, but because there are not a lot of processes to do that, it just falls for me short. Which is not to say that it's not important here or... Yeah, I mean... That he didn't do it. It just... Me, 80s jury member, I would eat it up. So... Yeah. Well, I think a lot of would uh, a lot of people would do that even now in 2020. You know, I, I think I'll, it goes back to that question of the difference of you have a good idea or a, they always talk about circumstantial evidence versus quote unquote real evidence. But the circumstantial evidence is important to build a case right. that can be backed up. So I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I, I, I'm with Sean and that if I was in on a jury in the 80s, I would have looked at this and said, done, slam dunk. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of times we've seen even DNA evidence being wrong, you know, now with new advances in touch DNA, uh, sorry, DNA or environmental DNA, we're seeing that that comes into question. So anytime that a case hangs everything on one piece of evidence, you really do have to look at it a lot closer. Yeah. And I'm not saying Pyre didn't do this at no. all. I'm just, for me, when I hear it's the past, especially, there's some newer technologies that may help with fibers. But to say you can match it 100%, this came from Pyre. And I, I mean, I didn't see the testimony, but that's, I mean, a lot of judges won't even allow you to say that about a bullet anymore, that these match 100%, because now we know that it can match several kinds of bullets or several kinds of guns. So. It's just dangerous technology. And I also happen to know that the person they used in this case, who doesn't testify, who dealt with the rope and the knots, was also not qualified to do so. So those are just things that bother me. They bother me in cases where people are found innocent. And so. And I think that's the dangerous thing is that when you're using faulty reasoning or faulty science, or there's a breakdown in the procedure that can open the door to allow guilty people to walk free as well as punish the innocent people. Seattle, Portland, LA, San Fran, San Diego, Scottsdale, Phoenix. This is Kay Wynn and Big Ben. And we are Western Standard Time. WSD Podcast. We're everywhere online. Podbeam, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. What do we talk about, Ben? We got all sports, NBA, NFL, MLB, Pac-12, WCC. If it's on the West Coast, we got you covered. You know what else we got you covered? A little lifestyle, a little fun, a little banter to lighten up your day. There are five-minute life guides. So whether you live in Seattle, Kansas City, Frisco, Texas, Boston, Worcester, Florida, and you love West Coast sports, make sure you follow us, download us. New episode every Friday. And we're out. Boom. Boom. Also, the CHP found with other with their own conclusions that he did it. Like he, and ended up firing him in May of 1987. So before the trial, they already like said, oh, I did it, and fired him. So it took a while, but he was finally fired. Besides all this evidence, they had all the people that were calling in after Kara's death, telling about the highway patrol officer and the very weird pullover, like when they would pull him over in the same area. So they had all those witnesses plus all this evidence. During jury selection, pretty much every prospective juror had heard about the case. This was a very public case, and I saw in one paper that the whole entire opinion section was dedicated to this trial. Just people saying he's innocent, saying he's guilty. It was just—it's a public, a huge public case. During this process, they talked about— his uh, appearance changing. When you see the video from his ride along, he almost looks his age. I mean, it's the 80s, so he, <laughs> to me, everyone looks older than they are. Uh, now, during this phase, only about a year later, he looks like like a 35 years older. 
not much that he aged, but he now wears gold rim glasses. He put on some weight and cut his hair shorter. Um, kind of like if you see the whole George Zimmerman case, how he went from George Zimmerman to the new George Zimmerman in a way. There were a couple of venue change bids since it seemed very hard for jury selection, but nothing happened. Once the jury was selected, the trial went on. Uh, They presented all this evidence, uh, had a bunch of witnesses like the people who called in talking about their experiences with Pyre. The prosecution had a witness that put a CHP car and a light-colored car pulled over on Mercy Road exit at the time Karanot was killed. I guess this witness was a surprise in the trial. They didn't have him before, and the defense did not uh, have any knowledge of him, but the judge allowed it. This was big news in the paper during the trial. It was in the paper like three consecutive days, this, this man driving a milk truck that placed him at the scene. During the trial at the beginning of February in 1988, the jury was taken to the scene where the car was found and the scene where the body was found. They will go there once during daylight and also at night to see the conditions. So the the defense had their own theory about a murdering hitchhiker. They had three different witnesses testify that there was a hitchhiker who was acting strangely that night on Interstate 15. One said that as she drove by, the hitchhiker jumped out at her car while she was on the on-ramp trying to get on the highway. Another witness said that they saw a hitchhiker waving money at them at the same on-ramp, and another guy just said that the hitchhiker really wanted a ride in a hurry. Another witness the next day said that she was driving at around 11.30 p.m. and saw three Latino men fighting with a woman matching Kara's description. Then it seemed like there was a whole lot of contradictions with the prosecution's witnesses. A lot of the witnesses that the prosecution brought to either say they were pulled over by Pyre or that they saw something happen, the defense was able to make them look like they didn't know what they were talking about. There was a couple that said that they witnessed the murder but couldn't agree on the make and color of the car. There was another lady who said that she got a ticket from Pyre and didn't forget the day because she worked at a hospital and that day a baby died. But when they did some research, they found out no baby died that day. It came out later that the baby was in intensive care and she thought it was going to die that night so that they just... They broke her story down even though she wasn't lying. Guys, I know we've discussed things like this before with eyewitnesses and like just how this is, you know, a year and a half later and you're getting new witnesses saying that they saw something the exact night a year and a half ago and knew everything. And do you think that the prosecution brought too many eyewitnesses in that ruined it because the defense was able to break them down. Do you think there was just too much evidence? I don't know. It seems like a lot of... So those were all prosecution witnesses? Yeah, so prosecution had witnesses. The defense just had the the hitchhiker ones. Like, the defense had the three that were saying this crazy hitchhiker is going. But with, like, the milkman who supposedly saw stuff and all these different people, it's... A lot of witnesses, and then the, def- the defense was able to, like, get the people to say, oh, no, the, the car wasn't the right color or stuff like that. Like, they broke down the prosecution's witnesses. So it was just, it seemed like a lot to me. Yeah, that would bother me, I think, as a juror, because it would feel like the prosecution is just putting anything out there. Right. And then that mixed with what I know of people's memories. Yes. I would just kind of feel like that's not good evidence for this trial. Right. But don't you think part of it, Two has to be a gamble. I mean, we all we know it's a gamble on the prosecution side, but also their suspect is a cop. You know, it's it's a California Highway Patrol officer who's I, I won't say a pillar of the community, but somebody who's known in the community who has a reputation. So they would need to make sure that there is an uh, overwhelming preponderance of the evidence pointing to uh, this guy as the person that did it, or else. Like you said, the jury might just kind of blow it. I mean, if you only had one or two witnesses against a cop, I think that people could might dismiss that a little bit easier. 
I do have a question about uh, part of what you told us. So they took the jury to the site where Kara was found two different times? Yeah, one, one during the day and one during the night. Was there any disagreement about doing that? I'm not really sure what the what the point of that would be. No, I just, like, it was a small little snippet uh, in the article. It just kind of reminds me of, like, the OJ trial. Like, I thought, yeah. you, know, you know, how <laughs> that, and that was really strange because once I watched that OJ thing and knowing that he was actually there and, like, yelled sitting on his bench, that was super weird. But, yeah, this just reminded me of it, and I they just wanted to look or the, I don't know if it was the prosecution or defense that wanted them to go or not. Almost like a bit of theatrics. Could be, yeah. To see where, like, to see if they have any feels when they're there. So the prosecution was mainly trying to say that this was something that got out of hand. Like, he pulled her over, she wasn't really listening to him, or some sort of altercation happened, and that's when he hit her with a flashlight. Uh, because of... Him hitting her, that's when he had to strangle her because it went too far. They even said that he most likely put her on the hood of the car and drove her to the side of the bridge so he wouldn't get any evidence in the car. So their big thing was that she he didn't necessarily intend to set out that night to kill her, but because of this altercation, he did and then purposely hid all the evidence. Yeah, I think with all the other people that came forward saying he's, you know, does these creepy, weird pullovers, I think they were probably going with that does happen. But this one got out of hand like he yeah, like you said, he he didn't intend for it to happen like this. So this story that they put together, do they have a lot of evidence for this or is it just kind of what they are positing happening yeah this is just like this is the prosecution saying this so they don't really have any evidence on it at all like they just have what they had before but they don't really have this is just what they might think happened it's frustrating for me because i really want this to be the person who did it mm -hmm. and if he did do it i want him to be in jail because it's such an awful crime and it, her poor family but it just feels like there's a lot of guessing. There, yeah, it and seems that bothers like, me. But like with the flashlight, I think I brought it up er, uh, earlier in the episode. Um, the, he, she has a mark over her eye that would fit one of those large police flashlights. So there's all that fiber evidence that you don't really think is that good of evidence. There's not. I mean, they have the blood, which it is a super rare blood type, but. Yeah, there's not much to go on besides these people seeing it, that it's at night when they're flying by on a freeway. And, yeah. you know, it, it's hard. I think that's part of the frustration, too, is that you see, you see these things that might, would be considered circumstantial evidence. But how many times have we read or seen or listened to prosecutors, you know, and people involved in the legal system say that a lot of times it is this circumstantial evidence that adds up to this is the story that makes the most sense given given all of these you know individually these puzzle pieces may not necessarily point in this direction but when you take them all and put them all together then that's the narrative that makes the most sense yeah so after hearing everything the nine men four women jury panel went into their chambers on february 17th 1988 to figure out the fate of Craig Pyre after a four-week-plus trial. They were giving, given three choices on what to do. Find him innocent, find him guilty of first-degree murder, or find him guilty of second-degree murder. So after a full week of deliberations and the jury going over the evidence and testimony, on Thursday, February 25th, the judge declares a mistrial as the jurors could not agree on a verdict. It looks like the big thing was that the autopsy couldn't establish a real solid time of death. So they did a liver temperature test, but it came back that the time of death was anywhere from 1 p.m. the day of the murder. So there's just way, because of that liver temperature test, there's too much time in the day. That goes all the way back. This murder was supposedly around 9.45 p.m., but this could have been at 1 p.m. going off the liver temperature. So some of the jury just thought there was too much time with not enough evidence to really place him. Yeah, but isn't that discounting then her boyfriend's testimony of like what time she, she left the house? Yeah, I mean, going to that, but then there was that other witness who said it was like 11.30 p.m. 
So oh, there, there's just there's too much time altogether. But yeah, I mean, with the boyfriend, you know, leaving the house, knowing when uh, the the parents call, it, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's I wouldn't want to be. A, I never would want to be a juror. I I I, I want to do it to do my duty, but like I'm I'd be a horrible juror, and I think I've talked about that before. So now we will have a second trial and jury selection for this starts on April 18th, 1988. Um, So to me, this seems fairly fast in how we've seen trials go. Like they're already on the second one and it's only a year and a half later. And we've seen things that go forever before they even get Mm -hmm. to the first trial. So I just found that interesting that this seems very speedy. I don't know if it has to do with being a highway patrol or just that it's such a high profile case. They want to, they don't want to dilly dally with it. I'm not really sure. I'm also not going to go into a huge detail on the second trial unless something really stands out since we, we already know a lot from the first. Uh, jury selection took forever since everyone knew about this case by now. One thing that did come out in the papers is that Pyre failed a lie detector, te- uh, lie detector test six days after he was arrested. Uh, being a CHP, he should have known the golden rule not to take one in the first place, right? We've talked about that a billion times. Yeah, but I, I was saying, finding it interesting because I think by now almost everyone knows that, that lie detectors are not admissible in court as evidence. Right, but they're still like, you fail it, you still look horrible to like anyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly think that's like one of the biggest reasons why they get them to take them is be, is is to swing that public. Again, I'm not I'm not taking pyre's side in this but just the fact that that's reported in the newspaper i mean i would argue that that would even poison the jury pool even more well, yeah that's like if, the whole thing if I, yeah if i read that in the paper oh man i'm gonna walk into there going he he you know failed a lie detector test he's obviously guilty right well the judge even got really mad about this report that came out in the paper because now it was another question that they had to ask potential jurors um, and some of them had read the paper and already knew about it. So it did. It it really tainted the jury pool. It wasn't until May 13th, almost a month later, that jury was selected. It was six men and six women, and the trial started on May 17th, 1988. Was the trial asked to be moved again? Uh, so the weird thing that I found is that the defense asked for it to be moved, but when the DA actually agreed, the defense immediately removed the request. Uh, any guess on why? Is this just like, was it a tactic to move it, but then they actually didn't want it? I, I don't know. It was weird. I would say it would be a delaying tactic because if we'd seen in some of the other cases where, like, uh, I'm, I'm thinking back to like Dorothea Puente when her defense attorneys asked to move uh, the trial outside of, of Sacramento area. Part of it was obviously to, to, because they thought that from that area, the jury pool would be tainted with people that already had a predisposition to vote one way or the other. But I also think it, it gave the defense more time to mount their, uh, mount their defense. So I wonder if in, in this case, they've already seen it come real close to them, you know, uh, like a hung jury mm-hmm. so, or a mistrial. So I look at it as maybe it was a, the defense attorneys waited to um, delay. Yeah. And the DA, the DA kind of preempted that and said, you guys want to move it? Go ahead and move it. It's not, you know, almost like playing chicken. Yeah. And then they're like, nah, <laughs> because yeah. they, they didn't want it at all moved. It's also possible that maybe they looked at the jury, the information that was kind of out there right. and thought that maybe that wouldn't go against them. It would actually be in their favor for jury right. members to have that. That makes sense. And there's all the all that thing of Pyre's lived in the area that you're still, you know, it seems like with police officers you have, it's potential that you'll get somebody on the jury from a local area that might that might have a, a softer spot for law enforcement from an, from that area because they would be seen as, oh, that's the person that's protecting our area rather than going somewhere else that you have no personal connection with yeah, law enforcement. Yeah, there could have been a friend of a friend of a friend who knew you on the, yeah. you know, and then... Or just somebody who had a, you know, if, if looking at like your hometown police department right, right, or right. your hometown law enforcement saying, you know, that's the person I, I may not personally know you, but, but, you know, the law enforcement or, or first responders did me a solid at some point. Yeah. yeah. California does have that kind of, I'm sure there are places where it would be very pro police. 
and yeah. other places where you, they would jurors might automatically be kind of a not against you, but not as willing to trust you. Well, I think that right. looking at the Rodney King trial, how it was moved to Simi Valley, which is I think it yeah. was like ninety percent police department. It's just seemed yeah. like you know you you had a police trial there, which is like a police town. So. And I think, I mean, that I think that's the interesting thing about the jury selection process in general, and the questions they ask, and and the request to move is so much. It's it's really is so much of a trial, uh, especially a trial like this, rests on who you get sitting in the boxes, mm-hmm. and there's so much variation and, and randomness and chance that there's an art to making sure that you get the right people. Your your side gets the right people in the boxes. So the defense in the second trial does not get to use a couple things that they did in the first. They'll not be able to use the hitchhiker story. So they also had to knock out those three witnesses that we talked about earlier. Another thing is they had an expert that say that the purple fibers did not match, but the judge said that they were the way that they checked if they matched was not useful for analyzing fibers. Another thing that I saw that I didn't see in the first trial was that there were receipts that Pyre got his patrol car washed the 28th of December, which was the day after and on the 30th. Before these two days, they said it was at the beginning of the month. So he washes his car at the beginning of the month. Then right after the murder, he washes it two days within each other. Mm hmm. A good couple weeks into the trial, one of the jurors was replaced, though it didn't say why. I did find later that the juror that had said something about Pyre before the trial to like friends or someone that he pretty much already made up his mind and thought he did it. So that juror was removed. One thing I noticed is that in the second trial is that even more new witnesses on both sides came forward saying they saw things that night. Find it kind of shocking that this was allowed. I mean, I think it's kind of hard because there's nothing saying that someone who comes forward later, that that memory is worse than the people who tell you something right at the beginning. It's just... So I don't know. Yeah, but it's just like, them, they're like, I don't know if it's that they got the, they really want him prosecuted or they got the guts finally. I, I It just seems to wait that long with such a, like, especially in this trial, you know, I, I just, I find it weird. Well, I, th- I think it's a common thing, too, that people... You know, once you start thinking about something or you think back, you know, something that you might thought of as innocuous and kind of a throwaway memory, you know, upon other reflection, you might think it has more meaning than it does. On top of which, both sides have had had time to re-examine and reinvestigate. So I imagine as a prosecutor, I'd be I'd be constantly trying to drill in and get more information and more information and more information. So it's bound to to bear fruit, you know. I also kind of wonder in these cases that are uh, where there's a lot of media and a policeman is involved, if people are both there, you have those people who want to come forward because they want the attention, but you also probably have a lot of people who saw something that do not want to be in the papers. Right. They're yeah. afraid of what it might mean if they come out against a police officer or even for one, you know, if what they're, what they saw could possibly mean for them that I just kind of wonder, I don't know how that plays out. With different witnesses, but I could see a witness who did definitely see something, but is afraid to come forward. Yeah. And it takes some time to do that. Yeah. And and in a crime like this, that it's hard to believe that there was not any any witnesses at all. But there seems to be a lot. But there is a lot of you know, <laughs> yeah. and it is on the side of the highway. And I'm you know, I'm trying to think back to like taking a car ride and looking at you know, as I'm driving, looking around and trying to pay attention to the road and then remembering a year later oh yeah i did see some guy on 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 the side of the road and it did look you know if i'm traveling at 65 70 miles an hour down the down an interstate i'm curious though why the defense i can understand the prosecution is going to slim down it's going to have a specific story it's going to focus the jury on that but why as a defense wouldn't you then bring all those people back in they were they weren't allowed well the hitchhiker okay. story wasn't allowed right but so all those other i think all those other people who have different stories they might have came in, and a lot of those a lot of those other people were built around that hitchhiker story. So if you're not if you're not allowed that hitchhiker story to be brought in as evidence, then a lot of those ancillary witnesses yeah. that back that up, there's no point in having them there because it's muddying it up, and and you're gonna they're gonna be objected to anyway and cross examined. So 
problem with that is then you you now have to spin a, a completely alternate theory about what happened. Also, the defense even tried to bring in a psychologist to say that witnesses' memories can be altered because of the high press coverage, but the judge wouldn't allow allow that. You've talked about stuff like that before too, Jessica. Yeah. In the second trial, the jury is given the option of manslaughter, which they were not allowed in the first trial, and the jury started deliberations on June 14th, 1988. After five days of deliberations, the jury came back with a verdict. Guilty of first-degree murder. Sentencing would be another month, but because it was first-degree, no matter what, Pyre would get at least 25 to life. Pyre showed no emotion when the verdict was read. Sam, Kara's father, read a poem in, in her memory. One thing I found interesting was that the judge told the jurors to be careful when talking about the case in public. They needed to make sure what they said is complete and accurate. Judge Huffman said, quote, Bear in mind, there is no such thing as an off-the-record comment by a former juror. I remember seeing interviews and press stuff from jurors like of the Scott Peterson case, and they did not, I don't think they got this advice <laughs> because they were kind of out of control right after. Any thoughts on... What, I, th- I thought it was pretty cool, what he, like interesting, and in how he's just trying to like say, "Whoa, watch yourself." Yeah, it's not very often that we've read or researched a case where the judge had those kind of specific instructions, or at least haven't seen it in the reporting. Right. Those specific instructions for jurors. I I wonder if part of that was predicated by the fact that that they are putting away a police officer, you know, for for twenty five years to life. Yeah. Too. Or I'm wondering if they were like a very. Uh, their body language during the whole entire thing seemed very out of control. Like maybe the judge just saw like some precursors of how they might be. They also, they've within this jury, they've also had one person break the rules already. Right. So maybe the judge felt honestly, Hey, you know, we've, we have a, an actual example of what happens when you break the rules. So make sure that you're, you're going forth and not doing that. Because of appeals for a new trial from the defense, which was not granted, the sentencing was changed to August 3rd. He did receive 25 to life at sentencing, and his wife stuck by him. She said that she feels for the Knott family, but they have the wrong man. In an article I was reading about sentencing, it mentioned that Pyre had two ex-wives. They kind of paint a different picture than his current wife. Um, I'm just going to read the paragraph from the article. It says, quote, Pyre's two ex-wives have described him as a blatant liar who likes to flirt with strangers and dominate his wives. They said they were not surprised he had been convicted of murder. Now, Sam Knott, Kara's father, did a lot. And Jessica, do you want to talk about some of the things Sam did? So Sam Knott, Kara's father, worked basically tirelessly. We know the family went and looked for her. They found her body. But their lives were really changed after that. And he wanted to change the justice system so it would work more favorably for victims. So one of the things that happened to the Knott family was that on February 5th, 1987, they woke up and opened the San Diego Union uh, newspaper. And it had a front page story about Kara's autopsy with graphic details. The police hadn't shared any of those details with the family, and they had actually no idea that that story was going to be run. Um, we'll see this kind of happen in another ep- in a cu- an upcoming episode to another family. The family was obviously very livid, so Sam worked to change policy so that police, investigators, and prosecutors would have more contact with families and let them know ahead of time if there was going to be something in the newspaper that they should know about, something that they didn't want to see, they could just kind of ignore it, not read it, to protect themselves basically. Sam Knott was also extremely involved in the second trial. He was very upset by the first trial and how it, the prosecutor kind of laid out facts and obviously in the um, decision that the jury made. So in the second trial, he was extremely involved. He was basically a member of the team. Uh, he helped with jury selection. He helped pick out court exhibits, decided who would testify, the judge, Richard Huffman, said, quote, Sam was possibly the most involved victim I've ever encountered. 
Sam also did a lot of other things. In 1987, I read that he worked with a Dr. Carol Jenny of the Sexual Assault Center at Seattle's Harborview Medical Center. She had told Sam not that they've been trying to get a federal grant for a university forensics lab specializing in DNA analysis. So he spearheaded the nation's first federal grant for a university forensics lab that specialized basically in that at the time when DNA is just coming into its own, which I thought was pretty amazing. He worked with an assemblyman in the area named Larry Sterling. The two of them worked together to change uh, the law to elevate missing persons of uh, property crimes. So we talked about that earlier in the episode when they call the Knott family is kind of shrubbed off, just go do something else. And they found out that when you call with a property crime, it goes before a missing persons. So he changed the law for that. Uh, he changed the law so that there was mandated training of handling of missing persons calls by police. He changed the law to require higher patrol, so the CHP in this case, to respond to calls like the knots if it falls within the jurisdiction. So prior to this, if you go into the police station because someone is missing or there's, been a, there's a crime that happened, the police station and the CHP are very different entities. So they wouldn't necessarily let the CHP know uh, that they need to be on the lookout for something at this time. Unfortunately, this, the highway in this case is very important. Care is on it. So they needed to change that. So when there's a missing persons, they involve the cow flooring and highway patrol as well. He passed the first state law requiring judges to consider public safety when setting bail. So prior to this, mainly they used if you showed up to court dates and lots of murderers got uh, in the 1980s got very low bail because you just had to make your appointments. He changed the law so that a judge could consider if you were an immediate danger at the time. He helped pass a bill, and I know this was a big issue for you, Sean, that included property into decisions about representation. So when Pyre goes in and says he wants to have a public defender, they don't include all of Pyre's assets, including his homes that he owns. That wasn't just that was just something they didn't use. So Sam not that made that obviously made him very angry. And so he changes the law so that you can include your um, assets. One of the things he was also very upset was they lived in an area where you couldn't, I mean, we've all, we still live in an area like this where you can just drive 10 minutes and you can no longer get on your phone uh, where Wi-Fi doesn't extend. Obviously, Wi-Fi is a new thing here, but GPS was just coming into its own. And in this area, it wasn't something that was used because it was, there weren't a lot of houses. It was mainly rural. So he worked with officials, including the president at the time, President Clinton, to kind of um, to deal with problems of GPS not covering rural areas and to get money for it to do so. That was extremely expensive at the time and rarely used for CHP and would, could obviously make a big difference. He sounds like somebody who went to every local meeting, every city council meeting. If there was a supervisor meeting, he went to it. He worked doggedly until 1994 so that the Board of Supervisors would approve $80 million in funding for radio communication packages between law enforcement and fire that included tracking so that you could call someone who was out on the highway and get them involved in searches. All of these things he worked very, very hard on. Not all of them were a net good. Some problems, some came with problems, um, but he really wanted to change the system. He worked with people like Mark Class when his daughter went missing and other uh, victims networks to try and get the word out. He spent his life really focused on that. One of, he had three main things he wanted to instill for the future. One is that he'd like society to stop romanticizing murders. Quote, everybody can name five monsters, but they can't name five victims. He also wanted to add beacon lights to freeway call boxes so that you could see them more readily. Yeah. And the third thing is that he wanted people to understand what families go through. Quote, people say the monster got a life sentence. They don't realize it's a life sentence for us, too. Yeah, he really did dedicate his life to help others after his tragedy. One of the big things that Sam Knott did was to work to establish the Kara Knott Memorial Oak Garden, now called the San Diego Crime Victims Oak Garden, in Los Peñasquitos Canyon Preserve, where Kara Knott's body was found. Uh, Sam worked really, really hard. I was just looking at pictures of this oak garden the other day, and it has rocks with victims' names from all over uh, the country and all over California, which I really think is a good tribute to what he wanted, which is a focus on victims and not on the person who commits those crimes. Sam gave the rest of his life to fighting for his daughter. 
One day in the year 2000, while Sam was working on the garden, he had a heart attack and died very close to the scene where Kara was found. I think what's what's powerful about Sam's story is it shows what one person can do to affect positive change after a terrible, terrible tragedy. I think on the same token, the sad thing is that the stuff that he was fighting for really is common sense. You know, you would think more people would be behind it, and, and eventually they did, but it's sad that it took this terrible tragedy to be the catalyst to enact change. Yeah. I think we've talked about that before, that it always takes something before change happens. And sometimes it's it's these horrible incidences. That, but he he got so much accomplished, which is amazing. As for Pyre, he constantly claims his innocence. In 2004, the DA asked Pyre if he would like to submit his DNA and get this so-called wrongful conviction um, over with. They were going to run his DNA to the boot found to the blood found on Kara's shoe. He denied the request. Um, so I don't. <laughs> it's an easy test. I don't know why you would deny it unless, for some reason, you thought you have the wrong DNA in your body. Uh, He has been denied parole every single time, and the last time in 2012, the board decided to give him the longest term possible of 15 years before he can come up for parole again, which would be 2027. Kara Knott was born February 11th, 1966, to Sam and Joyce Knott. She was the third child out of four. Kara graduated Valhalla High School in El Cajon in 1984. She then went on to San Diego State and worked on getting her teaching credential. From her parents, she was described as sunny, outgoing, and close to her family. Her mother also described Kara as tender-hearted. She was an artist, an animal lover, and a young woman who always had time for everybody. Both Kara and Sam are buried next to each other in the Singing Hills Memorial Park on the outskirts of El Cajon. Kara would be 54 years old as of today. For tonight's cold case, this comes straight from the San Diego County Sheriff's Department website. On October 9, 1987, the San Diego County road crew was finishing a job on Blossom Valley Road. They had been clearing out a ditch overgrown with weeds and debris and had advanced to a spot where the backhoe nudged something hidden in the underbrush. It was a decomposed body of partly clothed woman who was later identified as Diana Gail Moffat. The detectives who conducted the preliminary death investigated ruled Moffat's death as suspicious. As the investigation progressed, detectives discovered Diana Moffat was a sex worker in the San Diego and Portland, Oregon areas of the United States. Although extensive investigation was conducted, investigators never developed enough evidence to make an arrest. As the case remains unsolved, cold case detectives continue to investigate the circumstances surrounding the the death of Diana Moffat. However, detectives still need the public's help to identify the suspect or suspects involved. Sheriff's detectives are hoping that due to the passage of time, those who have knowledge of Diana's death have had a change of heart or a change of conscience. Detectives certainly hope anyone with knowledge of this suspicious incident will overcome any fear or, or coercion or retaliation and come forward and bring justice to Diana and her family. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Sheriff's Department on one of the following ways. Sheriff's Homicide Details, 858-285-6330 during business hours. Or Sheriff's Communication Center, 858-565-5200 outside of business hours. You can also dial Crime Stoppers at 888-580-8477. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. For a full list of our sources, as well as more information on the case, head over to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com. You can also support the show by finding a link to our Patreon on this page, which has the option of ad-free episodes, as well as finding a link to our web store where we have California True Crime gear for sale. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Chateau Walnut and Snail Ranch Studios. This is a production of Way Grimace.